Um, I hope that you all picked up a copy of the primer that we prepared on executive privilege outside. Um, if you didn't get a copy, please try to get one at the break. Um, it's, it's very informative. Um, I may help generate some questions later on. Um, I want to especially welcome our CLE participants today. Uh, in the past, in our recent memory, um, CLE has not been a part of this conference, so we would tremendously welcome um, any feedback you have for us on the program. Um, any journal member you see, please uh, feel free to give them any feedback. Um, to give you a general description of how the program is going to go today, we're going to have um, two papers presented in two separate panels. Um, each panel will involve the presentation of the paper. Um, we'll then have comments from three panelists. Um, and then uh, we'll have, hopefully have time for questions and, answer, and answers after that. Um, so please be thinking of your questions now. Um, I'll introduce our first panel in just a few minutes. But before that, I want to turn it over to our dean, Kate Bartlett, um, for some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Shannon. I want to add my welcome to Shannon's. It's, it's great to have you all here. Duke Law School is really quite pleased and proud to host this administrative law conference on executive privilege in the Bush administration. This conference really epitomizes what we have come to expect from Duke Law students when they organize conferences and especially uh, what we expect from the Duke Law Journal. First, we've got a great topic. I, I, you realize that if you've, if you've come. Uh, we've seen how important it is what information Congress has access to from the executive branch, not just in this administration, but in and prior administrations, particularly the um, most recent administration. This is a, an issue that is difficult to address apart from the particular poli politics of the specific administration, and yet one where we all have a stake in getting the right answer uh, that's going to apply regardless of the political party in power. I think this is a, a real core issue of our democratic system and one that's of considerable interest to the public and to our system of laws. So we've got a great topic. Um, we've got great organizers. I know there are many I should ta uh, thank. It takes a lot of uh, hard workers to pull off a conference like this uh, to conceive the topic as they have, to get to line up the right speakers, and to do all of that uh, detailed work that makes an event like this uh, flow so seamlessly. Um, but I do want to single out four people of the many uh, who really have played a part in this uh, in alphabetical order, <laughs> Lisa Campoli, Drew Dropkin, Jennifer Mellon, and Shannon Stevenson, who all worked especially hard uh, to, to have this conference uh, turn out well. Great sponsors. Um, I include here the Office of the Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies and our own law school program in public law. Duke, has, Duke as a university has developed the reputation which I think is well deserved for knowing how to facilitate true interdisciplinary work. Uh, and we, uh, we, we have a lot of conferences here. We've actually had three half-day conferences, or will have by tomorrow, three, three conferences this week alone, uh, not to mention our Kip Fry lecture and a number of other activities. Um, but here, as, as so often has been the case with our conferences here and elsewhere in the university, there seem to be at least always at least two disciplines uh, being represented, and this is uh, certainly an example of that. So great topic, great organizers, great sponsors, and of course, last but not least, what we have at today's conference are great speakers. Uh, Professor Mark Rosell from Catholic University is the leading political scientist who writes on the topic of executive privilege. He is the scholar who literally wrote the book on executive privilege a book which, if I understand correctly, is about to or has come out in its uh, second edition. And I'm told that Dr. Lewis Fisher probably knows more about the inner workings of congressional disputes with the president over disclosure of information than anyone else in the world. How's that? Uh, anyone, who, Even true. anyone who's able to dispute that <laughs> will uh, take that up a little later. Um, disputes over executive privilege tend to be difficult to document because so much goes on behind the scenes, but as the specialist on separation of powers issues at the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress, Dr. Fisher has been uniquely positioned behind the scenes to know what really goes on, and so he really brings quite a valuable perspective to this conference. I want to thank also our very excellent local talent who are serving on commentators, as commentators on the lead papers. The journal has summoned an expert from the law school and from the political science department 
of both Duke and UNC. Um, so we're really pleased that we were uh, able to get our first choices, or they were able to get their first choices and our first choices on those, on those topics from Duke. We have Professor Chris Schrader from the law school, Professor Mike Munger from the political science department, and from USC, UNC, Professor William Marshall from the law school, and Professor Terry Sullivan from the political science department. I want to thank these speakers for lending their expertise to this conference, the journal for making this conference happen, and all of you for coming. Thank you. I forgot to mention earlier one of the most important aspects of the conference, which is food. Um, we'll have a short break after the first panel with some refreshments outside, so please go out and get um, some cookies and Cokes. And um, afterwards, there will be a reception on the back patio, so I hope you all will um, join us there and um, come and talk to all of our presenters and panelists. Um, Dean Bartlett did a great job of introducing these guys. I'll just add a couple of things um, about our first panel here. Um, we are delighted to have these two of the foremost experts on executive privilege to present their papers. Um, Professor Mark Rosell is going to be presenting first. His paper is Executive Privilege Revived, Secrecy and Conflict During the Clinton and Bush Presidencies. Um, as Dean Bartlett mentioned, uh, Professor Rosell is a professor of politics at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And um, the second edition of his book, Executive Privilege, The Dilemma of Secrecy and Democratic Accountability, um, will be forthcoming this year. Um, Dr. Lewis Fisher is going to be our second presenter, um, so he will lead off the second panel, but he's also going to be serving as uh, a commenter on uh, Professor Rosell's paper. Um, Dr. Fisher's paper will be Congressional Access to Information Using Legislative Will and Leverage. Um, he's the Senior Research Specialist in Separation of Powers <clears throat> excuse me, at the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress. Um, he is the author of the fourth edition of American Constitutional Law, and he's also the subject of a recent book, Politics and Constitutionalism, the Lewis Fisher Connection. Um, so as soon as we all get books named after us, um, we'll be uh, <laughs> equally competent to come sit on this panel. Um, both of these gentlemen have been quoted extensively in the news um, with respect to the recent GAO lawsuit against Vice President Cheney. Um, and I'm just in intrigued and thrilled to hear what they will have to say today on these issues. Um, also serving on our first panel is Professor Terry Sullivan. He's Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of North Carolina. He's also the Associate Director of the White House 2001 Project and the Director of the White House Transition Project at the James A. Baker III Institute. Um, and we welcome him from uh, down 15501. Um, we also have Professor Christopher Schrader, who most of you will know here. He's the Charles S. Murphy Professor of Law and Public Policy here at the Law School. Um, he teaches administrative law as well as a very popular seminar on the Congress. And he's the Director of Program and Public Law, which is a generous sponsor of this event. Um, I also want to acknowledge Tim Hudson, who's going to be moderating this panel. Um, so when we get to the question and answer stage, um, Tim will be uh, calling and uh, letting people uh, direct, directing people to uh, answer specific questions. Um, so without further ado, let Professor Rosell begin his paper. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shannon, and thank you for all your good work, and uh, to the Duke Law Journal for putting this conference together. I'm delighted to be here. and. I want to compliment your good judgment in inviting two political scientists as your principal speakers at this law school forum. We're very flattered to be here and uh, to talk a little bit about executive privilege, which um, is a subject I care very deeply about and I'd like to make my pitch that more people care about this subject and do some formal writing about it. I think it would be a great help to scholarship in this area that uh, more people be involved in discussing this controversial issue because there are so many areas of executive privilege that I think uh, remain unsettled and open to interpretation, and I find myself struggling with the subject as I'm moving from first edition to second edition of a book, and uh, even my own views on some aspects of this issue evolving as I study it over time. Uh, as I understand executive privilege, I, uh, I call it an implied power uh, derived from Article 2, and it's most easily defined as the right of the president and high executive branch officers to withhold information from those who have compulsory power uh, particularly Congress and the courts, and then, of course, ultimately from the public. Now, this right is not absolute, although some presidents have tried to make that claim that it is. And today, I believe executive privilege is most legitimate uh, when it is used first for certain national security needs and second for protecting the confidentiality of White House deliberations when it is in the public interest to do so. 
And related to the second, executive privilege may be appropriate in circumstances where confidentiality is absolutely necessary to protect ongoing investigations in the executive branch. Now, after the Watergate scandal, several presidents have exercised executive privilege very cautiously uh, or very weakly, and it was not until the Clinton administration did a president make a really concerted effort to try to exercise this presidential power. Uh, Clinton indeed exercised this power more times than all of the other post-Watergate uh, presidents combined, and yet I will argue, as the evidence demonstrates, most of his uses of executive privilege were indefensible, and he ultimately contributed to the further downgrading of this presidential power. In the slightly more than first year of his administration, President George W. Bush has already made substantial use of executive privilege in circumstances where I believe, once again, its exercise is highly debatable. Uh, just a little historic background, and I'll keep this part of the paper short because I really want to emphasize the uh, Clinton-Bush cases, particularly Bush, uh, since that's the focus of this conference. President Eisenhower holds the record for the most uses of executive privilege. Uh, it's been estimated over 40 times. Uh, getting reliable estimates is hard to do with regard to executive privilege for the reasons stated earlier that uh, actions taken in secret sometimes uh, we don't find out about until many years later on. Uh, but many of these assertions amounted to refusals to comply with congressional requests for testimony from White House officials, and Eisenhower felt so strongly about this principle that at one point he stated, any man who testifies as the advice that he gave to me won't be working for me that night. And a key event in the development of executive privilege was uh, a letter he wrote in May of 1954 to the Secretary of Defense instructing department employees not to comply with a congressional request to testify about confidential matters in the Army McCarthy hearings. Now, Eisenhower articulated the principle that candid advice is absolutely essential to the proper functioning of the executive branch and that limiting candor ultimately harms the public interest. Uh, many of Eisenhower's uses of executive privilege were clearly justified, but the breadth of his understanding of this principle uh, was very disturbing to many. At one point, he effectively declared that executive privilege belongs to the entire executive branch, uh, when in fact over the course of history the practice has been to confine its use to the president and high-level White House officials when directed to do so by the president. Uh, he declared all advice to the president not subject to the compulsory powers of the other branches, although the development of executive privilege law more recently has resulted in a key distinction between discussions about official governmental matters and those about private matters. Now, members of Congress tried to rein in Eisenhower's successors through the articulation of standards for the use of executive privilege. And this started in the Kennedy administration with Representative John Moss of California, the chairman of the House Committee on Government Information. Uh, he began the practice of the chair of that committee at the beginning of each administration, writing a letter asking for clarification regarding that administration's formal uh, policy and procedures for the use of executive privilege. Uh, President Kennedy happily replied, uh, that executive privilege can be invoked only by the president and will not be used without specific presidential approval. And President Johnson similarly responded that the claim of executive privilege will continue to be made only by the president. Now, ironically, President Nixon responded most forthrightly to Moss's inquiry uh, when he wrote the following, the scope of executive privilege must be very narrowly construed. Under this administration, executive privilege will not be asserted without specific presidential approval. I want open government to be a reality in every way possible. Uh, further in his memorandum, he said, uh, this administration will invoke this authority only in the most compelling circumstances after a rigorous inquiry into the actual need for its exercise. For those reasons, executive privilege will not be used without specific presidential approval. Now, as you know, unfortunately, Nixon's practices gave executive privilege a bad name and had a profoundly chilling effect on the ability of his immediate successors either to clarify procedures on the use of executive privilege or to properly exercise that power. President Ford began what became a common post-Watergate practice of avoiding executive privilege inquiries and using other constitutional or statutory sources of authority as the basis for withholding information, uh, primarily from Congress. Now, unlike Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, Ford ignored uh, Congressman Moss's letter asking for an articulation of the administration's executive privilege procedures. It was quite clear that President Ford understood that this was just too politically hot, that executive privilege and memories of Watergate had, been, had become joined, in effect. Uh, and in fact, as I was reading through the White House papers from the Ford Library, uh, his associate counsel writing a memorandum suggesting to the President that uh, 
you know, just stay away from this phrase, executive privilege, it's too politically hot, cite exemptions from FOIA as a basis for withholding information, or uh, call it presidential or constitutional privilege, or, or find some statutory basis for withholding information, but whatever you do, stay the heck away from that phrase, executive privilege, because you'll immediately be equated with Nixon-like tactics. Uh, this was uh, you know, pretty common thought at that time, and President Carter similarly did not respond uh, to the congressional inquiry asking for an articulation of the administration's policy on executive privilege. And also President Carter um, behaved similarly to Ford in that he avoided the use of the words executive privilege even in cases where uh, such an assertion may have been completely appropriate. President Reagan, uh, contrarily, tried to revive the principle of executive privilege, but he ended up losing all of his battles with Congress on a number of occasions. Uh, his administration made a very strong claim that they were going to recover lost presidential prerogatives uh, and to stake a strong position against Congress and stand on principle. And then when Congress pushed with uh, subpoenas and contempt citations or threats thereof, the administration in every single case ultimately caved and gave Congress everything that it wanted. Uh, nonetheless, importantly, Reagan issued an executive privilege memorandum in 1982 articulating the administration's principles with regard to its use and it reaffirmed the need for confidentiality of some communications it said and added that executive privilege would be used only in the most compelling circumstances and only after a careful review demonstrates that assertion of the privilege is absolutely necessary finally executive privilege shall not be invoked without specific presidential authorization so we see over time uh, the development of executive privilege as a presidential based power uh, that should be exercised only with specific presidential approval. Uh, Reagan's memorandum developed greater clarity of procedures than before. All congressional requests must be accommodated unless compliance raises a substantial question of executive privilege, and such a question arises if the information might sufficiently impair the national security, including the conduct of foreign relations, the, the deliberative process of the executive branch, or other aspects of the performance of the executive branch's constitutional duties." Okay, end quote there. Uh, by avoiding executive privilege, Presidents Ford and Carter, I think, actually succeeded more than Reagan did in protecting presidential secrecy. Reagan tried to reestablish the legitimacy of executive privilege only to be harshly criticized every step of the way by an opposition party-led Congress. And again, he ultimately backed down from all of his battles, and as I've documented elsewhere, I feel that he weakened the principle of executive privilege by taking the tack of using executive privilege as an opening bid in his battles with Congress and standing strong and saying, he was going to protect this prerogative, and then negotiating down from there until he eventually gave up. Uh, President George H.W. Bush did not initiate any new executive privilege procedures, and he was more like Ford and Carter in that he avoided uh, the use of the words executive privilege, and in fact, in my research, President Bush uh, cleverly used a number of different phrases and justifications for withholding information, anything but calling it executive privilege with one exception. And some of the phrases that his administration used were internal departmental deliberations, deliberations of another agency. Uh, my favorite was the secret opinions policy, uh, where they denied congressional access to information because it falls under the Department of Justice's secret opinions policy, which no one had ever heard of before. But um, it sounded a heck of a lot better, I guess, than executive privilege. Unlike their post-Watergate predecessors, Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush have not been reluctant to exercise executive privilege. Each made a number of attempts to revive the presidential power to withhold information from Congress, independent councils, and the public. Each also made it clear that he believed that executive privilege is a legitimate presidential power that has eroded over time and has to be reestablished. Nonetheless, Clinton and Bush use executive privilege beyond the traditional boundaries of protecting either certain national security needs, the candor of internal deliberations when revealing such information would cause undue harm to the public, and protecting ongoing criminal investigations. Uh, President Clinton tried to use executive privilege on a number of occasions to thwart investigations into allegations of corruption or illegality, exactly the types of circumstances for which executive privilege never should be used. In the first year of his presidency, Bush attempted to revive executive privilege by improperly closing off congressional access to certain Department of Justice documents and by issuing an executive order overriding certain provisions of the Presidential Records Act of 1978. Now, the Clinton and Bush cases reveal, I think, that the era of presidential reluctance to use executive privilege or even say the words executive privilege is over. Uh, unlike their predecessors, rather than try to cloak or avoid this constitutional principle, Presidents Clinton and Bush have openly used executive privilege on a number of occasions, and they have thus reignited the national debate 
over this constitutional principle. Uh, nonetheless, reestablishing the constitutional stature and political viability of executive privilege requires that presidents exercise this power judiciously. And I don't believe that that has always uh, been the case. Uh, I'm, I'm a believer in the principle of executive privilege. I wrote a whole book in, in defense of the principle of executive privilege, and I find myself increasingly criticizing presidents for asserting this power that I believe in so strongly. But I think we have to look on a case-by-case -case basis on whether each invocation of executive privilege is appropriate. Uh, and it does nothing to further the cause of uh, reestablishing the constitutionality or the political viability of executive privilege when presidents uh, do what has been happening so often in recent years, which is oftentimes throwing it out there as sort of a, a lawyer's arsenal of, of various tactics that might be used to try to get the upper hand uh, in, a, uh, in a conflict with uh, an independent counsel or with Congress and then negotiating down from there, which I think ultimately weakens the principle. Uh, let me talk about Bill Clinton now and, and then focus more on George Bush. In 1994, the special counsel to the President, Lloyd Cutler, issued a memorandum clarifying the administration's procedures for handling executive privilege claims. And the memorandum stated the following. I apologize for quoting so much here, but it's important to get the, the flow of the development here of uh, uh, the principle of executive privilege and how it's been applied. Uh, he said, the policy of this administration is to comply with congressional requests for information to the fullest extent consistent with the constitutional and statutory obligations of the executive branch. Executive privilege will be asserted only after careful review demonstrates that assertion of the privilege is necessary to protect executive branch prerogatives. Uh, furthermore, the memorandum stated executive privilege belongs to the president and not individual departments or agencies. The stated procedures for handling executive privilege disputes were consistent with those of Clinton's predecessors, yet in light of later events, one sentence from Cutler's memorandum stands out. It reads, in circumstances involving communications related to investigations of personal wrongdoing by government officials, it is our practice not to assert executive privilege, either in judicial proceedings or in congressional investigations and hearings. Uh, the Clinton administration adopted the very broad view that all White House communications are presumptively privileged. Furthermore, the administration position was that Congress has a less valid claim to executive branch information when conducting oversight than when writing legislation. This is a distinction that just flat out lacks credibility. Yet several administrations have resorted to it in order to resist congressional oversight and investigations. The Clinton administration also refused to release to congressional investigators any documents that the White House deemed subject to a claim of executive privilege. In other words, on numerous occasions, the White House withheld documents under the principle of executive privilege without actually formally invoking that constitutional power. Consequently, the real extent of President Clinton's use of executive privilege has been somewhat masked by White House claims that many uses of that power didn't really count because no one formally invoked it. Uh, but the effect, obviously, was exactly the same. Uh, in, the, in the core of this text, which um, is extremely long and simply impossible to cover in detail in the uh, course of this presentation, I. Um, I, I believe they've put this up on their website, actually, so you can have access to the full paper and all the documented evidence about each particular case of executive privilege. But I go case by case uh, through the Clinton and the Bush years in discussing all the various uses of executive privilege and, and uh, you know, arguing whether these particular cases reflect the traditional standards for the use of executive privilege or whether they fall short. Uh, just a few that I'll highlight. One such controversy was the travel office investigation, you may remember. Uh, here, the resolution of this case followed a similar pattern to uh, the use of executive privilege by Clinton's predecessors. Congress sought access, the White House delayed, and eventually claimed executive privilege when Congress members would not give up. Congress issued subpoenas, threatened to hold White House officials, uh, current and former in this case, in contempt. Uh, the White House avoided a full vote on contempt by caving into Congress's demands. Uh, a review of the documents I looked at revealed that there was no substantive reason for claiming executive privilege in the first place, and ultimately dragging out the invest it ultimately dragged out the investigation for a period of more than three years. Indeed, some of the disputed documents included those involving discussions between the First Lady and White House staff, and then White House talking points for Democratic House committee members, among other materials that are just simply not ever covered by the principle of executive privilege. Uh, Another case was the William Kennedy notes dispute. Again, you can get the details on the, uh, uh, from the article, but this involved 
uh, the presence of private lawyers along with government lawyers in a room uh, giving advice and the administration asserting essentially that Congress could not have access to certain information uh, because the president's private attorneys were present. And also there was a controversial assertion that um, here the administration could use the attorney-client privilege in a case of a congressional inquiry, which simply had not happened before. Uh, Congress simply does not recognize the uh, attorney-client privilege in the cases of congressional inquiries. And a court has never recognized such a pr principle uh, in cases of congressional investigations. Uh, here, nonetheless, the White House chose to raise a common law privilege rather than a constitutionally based one, such as executive privilege, where perhaps a claim of executive privilege may have been more appropriate. Um, but the White House took the unprecedented step of claiming that a meeting that involved White House attorneys, concerned government uh, business, was protected by attorney-client privilege because the private attorneys of the Clintons were also present. Now, you can imagine that if this was allowed to stand, uh, that would mean that any time a president wants to conceal information from Congress, all he has to do is invite a private lawyer and hold a meeting at an office uh, outside government property uh, at a private lawyer's uh, uh, particular facility. So I, I would not be too terribly comfortable if that precedent had been established. Uh, the White House did reach an accommodation with the Office of Independent Counsel that allowed the production of the Kennedy notes as long as the Independent Counsel agreed that the White House thereby did not waive any constitutional principles. So. It's one of those cases where both sides kind of walk away saying we win because uh, Congress gets what it wants and the administration says we preserve the principle. Okay, the, uh, the Mike Espy case I think stands as one of the more important ones because here we had a court decision uh, in Ray Seal case 1997 where the court distinguished between a presidential communications privilege and the deliberative process privilege. And according to the court decision, uh, these are executive privileges that exist to protect confidential executive branch deliberations. Uh, the former belongs to the president and includes deliberations between the president and White House staff or other executive branch officials. It also includes deliberations among presidential advisors in their task of preparing advice for the president. Uh, these advisors must be individuals directly involved in presidential decision making. Now the deliberative process privilege by contrast is a common law privilege that belongs to executive branch officials more generally, but it's much more easily overcome by a showing of need for information. Indeed, this latter privilege, the court said, disappears altogether when there is any reason to believe that government misconduct has occurred. Uh, in weighing the need for information, the court said that two questions have to be asked. Uh, first, is the information directly relevant? And second, is the information available from some other source? The court ultimately determined that the balancing test weighed in favor of the independent counsel's need for information in a criminal investigation. The White House, according to the court, was withdrawing, withholding materials that were directly relevant to an investigation, information that could not reasonably be found elsewhere. So here the court upheld the principle of executive privilege while striking down uh, the particular invoking of that power as improper. I then discuss in the paper a number of different cases where I believe that there were similarly weak claims of executive privilege, but in some cases Congress uh, simply gave up the fight and the administration prevailed. In other cases, uh, Congress mostly got what it wanted. And i uh, refer you also to my colleague Lou Fisher's essay where he talks about how Congress has different vehicles through which it can get access to executive branch information. And that is very germane to a number of the cases that I talk about uh, in this paper. Okay. Uh, Finally, let me just talk a couple minutes about the Lewinsky case. Obviously, that, that's a hard one to avoid. Um, but I, I think it's hard to imagine a more dubious use of executive privilege than to conceal information during the investigation of Clinton's actions in that particular scandal. Uh, national security obviously was not at issue, although Clinton's White House counsel tried to argue in his court filings that, and I quote, harming the president's ability to influence the public, he said, uh, undermines his ability to lead foreign policy, which is analogous to saying that anytime you criticize a president, perhaps it should be unconstitutional because you knock down the president's uh, public esteem and that hurts the president's stature abroad and that therefore hurts the American uh, constitutional system and our ability to conduct foreign policy. It's a terribly lame argument. Um, but you know that, that's about as far as they could go in saying that the Lewinsky case in some way involved uh, the, the, the public interest or, uh, or national security. On the other hand, though, they are also stating the principle that presidents have a right to receive candid advice. And I believe, indeed, that presidents are entitled to uh, receive candid confidential advice. And the principle of executive privilege extends to presidential advisors because they must be able to uh, deliberate and discuss policy options without fear of immediate public disclosure of their every utterance. And without that protection, I think that the 
candor and quality of presidential advice ultimately would suffer. Um, now here the Clinton administration maintained that the SB case decision justified any claim of privilege regarding records or recollections of discussions between the president and his aides, between and among aides, and even between the first lady and an aide. Um, and so it became a controversial discussion as to whether you can really extend the principle of executive privilege that broadly. Uh, the key issue is whether the White House discussions indeed had anything to do with official governmental business as opposed to merely being deliberations over how to handle political strategy during a scandal. Uh, Judge Johnson ultimately ruled against Clinton's use of executive privilege, as you know, and although much of her reasoning gave credibility to White House arguments, she correctly determined that the balancing test weighed in favor of the independent counsel's need for access to information that was crucial to a criminal investigation. Now, to prevail, I think Clinton needed to make a compelling argument that the public interest somehow would suffer from the release of information about White House discussions over the Lewinsky investigation. Not only had he failed to do so, but for months he even refused to answer a basic question as to whether he had formally invoked the privilege. And you may remember in one case where he was traveling abroad, he was in South Africa, uh, the president was asked about whether he was asserting executive privilege and he said he knew nothing of the matter, that that was something handled by the White House lawyers and go talk to the people back in Washington. Uh, this is a presidential power. The, you know, the, the case law and the evolution of this concept makes it absolutely clear uh, that this is something to be asserted uh, by the president himself uh, or to be asserted uh, with the president's approval by high executive branch officers, but the president was playing, in a sense, not dumb, but ignorant of uh, you know, the whole situation as to whether executive privilege was, was going on. Uh, even after losing in court, the White House made additional claims of privilege um, and this is interesting because they dropped their claim of executive privilege initially after the ruling. Uh, White House counsel Charles Ruff declared victory because the judge had ultimately upheld the legitimacy of the principle of executive privilege and therefore preserved this power for future use by presidents. And he said that that's what the whole battle was all about as far as the White House was concerned, not protecting President Clinton personally, not protecting his administration, but a more high-minded concern about protecting a constitutional principle for future administrations. Um, it's hard to believe that the president had so aggressively used executive privilege in this scandal merely because he was motivated by a desire to protect the constitutional principle for his successors. It is difficult to imagine that a president who wished to protect this constitutional principle would do so during a sex scandal rather than during a military operation or some other crisis with national security implications. I think the evidence suggests that Clinton used executive privilege merely to frustrate and to delay the Starr investigation. Even after losing in court, as I said, they made additional claims of executive privilege. In August of 98, a White House attorney and deputy White House counsel claimed executive privilege in testimony before the grand jury. Clinton told the grand, grand jury that he merely wanted to protect the constitutional principle once again. Um, and then the president later, later, several days later, challenged one in, unfavorable court ruling and directed another aide once again to assert executive privilege. Um, I think Clinton's success in frustrating and delaying the investigation through many claims of executive privilege and other legal devices helped to save his presidency. Uh, the many delays allowed the administration to build a case over a period of months before the public that the long and drawn out and very expensive investigation was all Ken Starr's fault. In the end, there were no real winners in this situation. The president may have saved his administration, uh, but his actions certainly were not vindicated. And by his actions, I think Clinton, like Nixon before him, damaged the credibility of executive privilege. Okay, let me, um, let me turn now to the Bush administration. Uh, I think it's quite clear that President Bush does not feel at all constrained in using executive privilege because of what happened during his predecessor's administration. And I think that's perfectly right to hide from executive privilege as the initial post-Watergate presidents did, uh, simply because one fears that it has a negative connotation is to equate the abuses of a power uh, with that power itself, and I think that's wrong. Executive privilege is a clearly constitutional principle when exercised under the appropriate circumstances. Uh, so I think it's unfortunate that the first president to have made a sustained effort to use executive privilege did so in some very sus suspect circumstances. Uh, president Bush has made it very clear that he wants to reestablish the viability of certain presidential prerogatives. Sounds a lot like the rhetoric uh, during the Reagan administration, actually. And President Bush, similarly, uh, as with Mr. Clinton, has started out with a number of uses of executive privilege early on, uh, perhaps in part to con convey his seriousness about applying this principle and trying to establish its viability. Uh, let, me, let me go through the three cases that I cover in the paper on Bush's use of 
executive privilege. Uh, the first deals with the Presidential Records Act of 1978, uh, where Congress passed this act to provide procedures for the public release of papers from past presidential administrations. The act allowed for the public release of presidential papers 12 years after administration had left office. Uh, the principle further, uh, being furthered by the law, was that these presidential records ultimately belong to the public and should be made available for inspection within a reasonable period of time. And the act gave responsibility for implementing this principle uh, to the National Archives and Records Administration. President Reagan in 1989 offered an executive order that uh, clarified uh, some of the procedures uh, with regard to the implement, uh, implementation regulations of NARA. Uh, President Reagan's executive order identified three areas in which records can be withheld, national security, law enforcement, and the deliberative process of the executive branch. Reagan's executive order gave a sitting president primary authority to assert executive privilege over the papers of former presidents, and furthermore, uh, he recognized that a former president has the right to claim executive privilege over its administration's papers. Nonetheless, it also said that the archivist of the United States did not have to abide by this claim of executive privilege. Uh, the incumbent president could override the archivist with a claim of executive privilege, but only after a 30-day time limit uh, for review, time period for review. And after that period, absent a formal claim of executive privilege, the documents have to be automatically released. Now, in November 2001, President George W. Bush issued an executive order to supersede Reagan's executive order and to vastly expand the scope of privileges available to current and former presidents. Under the new executive order, former presidents may assert executive privilege over their own papers, even if the incumbent president disagre uh, disagrees. Indeed, Bush's executive order also gives a sitting president the, the president the power to assert executive privilege over a past administration's papers, even in cases where a former president is perfectly comfortable with allowing those papers to be released. Uh, the Bush standard, therefore, allows any claim of privilege over documents, either by an incumbent or a past president, to stand. Furthermore, the Bush executive order requires anyone seeking to overcome constitutionally based privileges to have a demonstrated specific need for presidential records. Now, the Presidential Records Act of 1978 did not contain such a high obstacle for those seeking access to presidential documents to overcome. Uh, thus, under the Bush executive order, the presumption always is in favor of secrecy, whereas previously the general presumption was in favor of openness. Now, although this controversy remains unresolved, it is clear uh, that Bush's executive order supersedes the intent of an act of Congress, and it attempts also to expand executive privilege far beyond the traditional standards for the exercise of that power. Uh, I think there is legal precedent for allowing a pres former president to assert executive privilege, yet the standard for allowing such a claim is very high. Uh, and a former president simply cannot make a claim of executive privilege stand uh, simply because he has some personal or political interest in preserving secrecy. An ex-president's interest in maintaining confidentiality erodes substantially once he leaves office. Uh, the Bush executive order does not acknowledge any such limitation on a former president's interest in confidentiality. Uh, furthermore, this executive order makes it easy for such claims by former presidents to stand and almost impossible for those challenging the claims to get information in a timely way in order to be useful. Uh, the legal constraints will effectively delay requests for information for years as these battles are fought out in the courts. I think these obstacles alone will simply settle the issue in favor of former presidents because many with an interest to uh, and access to information will not have the ability or the resources to get dragged into a long court battle uh, in trying to get access to information. So here, the burden shifts from those who must justify withholding information to fall instead on those who have to make a formal claim for access to information. I see I, I can go pretty short on this because you have a nice informational uh, uh, piece of paper, uh, or, uh, document there for everybody. Uh, that talks about some of the recent cases, particularly the Cheney Task Force case, which I discuss in this paper at some length. Uh, just very briefly, though, uh, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the GAO position, but I'm not entirely sure that it's going to prevail. The initial request uh, by Congress members Waxman and Dingell and also by the GAO was entirely too broad and far-reaching and went into the deliberative areas of the executive branch. Uh, they have since narrowed their request to asking for information specifically on the names of individuals who were consulted by the Energy Task Force and the times and places of meetings that took place, which seems to me pretty benign information and uh, 
hardly the kind of stuff that they should be having a constitutional crisis over uh, and going to court over, but uh, that seems to be the direction that it may be going uh, at this particular point. Uh, there has been no direct presidential claim of executive privilege in this case, but there may as well have been because Vice President Cheney and his assertion of the need for secrecy in this case made all the traditional arguments used in defense of executive privilege, or as the head of the GAO said in his response, you've used the same language and reason, reasoning as assertions of executive privilege. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, Vice President Cheney is concerned that he's going to be dragged into a process where if he allows this information to get out, the names of individuals, then the next step is going to be a request for testimony or other forms of information. So I understand why he's doing what he's doing. But nonetheless, I don't think that gives whatever the motivations of those seeking the information may be, and we can't be absolutely sure what they are, whether it's politically motivated or not, the reality is that this is a pretty narrow range of information that uh, members of Congress and the GAO specifically are seeking. And I think ultimately that this information uh, should be turned over uh, since it's not involving direct deliberative uh, information. It's not involving direct presidential communications, in fact, which is uh, the legal standard. Okay, the, uh, the other case I want to talk about in the few, few moments that I have is uh, President Bush's first formal claim of executive privilege in December 2001, and this was in response to a congressional subpoena for prosecutorial records from the Department of Justice. The House Government Reform Committee, chaired by Dan Burton, uh, was investigating two separate matters that concerned Department of Justice decision-making. First, the committee was examining the decision by former Attorney General Reno to refuse to appoint an independent counsel to investigate allegations of campaign finance abuses in the 1996 Clinton-Gore campaign. Second, the committee was examining allegations of FBI corruption in the Boston office uh, that was looking at organized crime in the 1960s and 1970s. Now, the committee made it clear that it was not requesting Department of Justice documents or other mater materials pertaining to any ongoing investigation. Nonetheless, Bush instructed Attorney General Ashcroft not to comply with the congressional requests for any deliberative documents from the Department of Justice. Now, at the core of this battle was a dispute over whether an administration can withhold any documents pertaining to prosecutorial matters, even if those matters, uh, even if those investigations are officially closed. Uh, I found it quite odd that the administration was staking the claim that it has a right to withhold all prosecutorial documents. Much like saying the words national security, you say prosecutorial, and that settles the argument in, in, uh, on behalf of the administration. They win uh, simply because Congress should not be able to have access to such kind of information. Uh, it was tr puzzling to me that the Bush administration took its first executive privilege stand over materials concerning a closed investigation. Uh, here they're trying to make the argument that they want to recover the lost ground of executive privilege after years of the Clinton scandals, as uh, Vice President Cheney has put it, after years of executive branch powers withering and Congress becoming uh, overly investigative and so forth. And yet, once again, they chose, I think, not the best case to articulate the principle and try to reestablish its viability. Uh, there was no clear public interest stake in protecting old investigative documents and other materials. And this claim of privilege uh, simply did not fall under any of the traditional standards of uh, protecting uh, national security, ongoing deliberations, or uh, confidential deliberations. These were documents that on average, in the case of the Boston mob case, were over 20 years old uh, that the administration was trying to close off on the principle that Congress cannot have access to any prosecutorial documents no matter what. Just imagine how far back that can stretch if that principle were to hold, if, uh, if that principle were to be established. I actually participated in that hearing in Congress, and it was absolutely extraordinary because you had uh, all the Republican members one by one saying how they had been called the night before by the White House, being urged to step back from this, and every single one of them saying, no way. Uh, this is a matter of Congress's constitutional authority. It doesn't matter whether this man has 80, 90 percent approval rating or member of our own party or what. You know, let me tell you what we think about it. And uh, they were among the most critical. You know, it wasn't the Democrats on the committee. It was the Republicans who uh, went after the president really, really hard on this particular matter. Uh, the ultimate, quote, unquote, resolution is that the administration uh, caved on a number of the documents, uh, turned over to the committee much of what it wanted, but was able to protect a certain narrow category of documents so that once again, as happens in so many of these cases, the two sides come to an accommodation where they both 
walk away claiming victory. Okay, just a few concluding comments now, and uh, I'll finish right up. Uh, the early post-Watergate era, I think, has represented a time of presidential reluctance to use executive privilege, understandably so in the early years because of the negative taint of that constitutional principle. President Reagan tried to reestablish it. He did not succeed. Uh, Presidents Clinton and now Bush have tried to reestablish or re revive the use of executive privilege. Uh, but, of course, they have, as I've argued in more detail in this paper, run into a great deal more trouble than necessary because of the ways in which they've used executive privilege. Thus, what is the current standing of executive privilege? The debate on executive privilege, I think, over the past generation has shifted dramatically. Few any longer call it a constitutional myth, as the famous book by Raoul Berger, uh, entitled by those words, said in the early 1970s. And I wrote a book primarily in response to his argument saying, I'm not going to give Berger the last word on this, even though so many others had done so, because I thought his argument was flat out wrong. Uh, the principle of executive privilege is widely accepted today, although there is considerable debate about the proper parameters of this power. Uh, it certainly has not helped that the most recent presidents, both strong advocates of executive privilege, have overreached in their exercise of this power. To clarify the parameters of this power, some advocates have argued for the adoption of a statutory definition of executive privilege. Others have expressed the hope for some future court decisions that will provide more guidance and more specificity on the principle of executive privilege. I argue that neither proposed solution is desirable or necessary. The resolution of conflicts over executive privilege resides in the theory of the separation of powers as envisioned by the constitutional framers. Congress especially and the courts possess the institutional powers necessary to challenge presidential exercises of executive privilege. Indeed, as the case examples that I cited in this paper show, Congress has not been reluctant in the modern era to use the authority that it has to conduct hearings, call witnesses, subpoena documents, hold administration officials in contempt, among other powers, in order to compel the release of executive branch information. And that's the way the system should work. The Watergate and Lewinsky scandals show that the courts have the authority to compel the release of presidential materials or the testimony of White House aides. So long as the other branches vigorously protect their prerogatives, presidential misuses of executive privilege will be curtailed. There is no need for a legislative or judicial imposed solution to prevent such possible future misuses of executive privilege when these branches already possess the constitutional powers necessary to successfully challenge presidents. Okay, thank you. Oh, it just say it occurred to me you um, bring up a theme that you could develop more, and I, maybe I could. Initially, uh, James Madison and others thought that each branch would protect its own institution through checks and balances. There would be an institutional interest, and that's a long-term interest. And in one of the early conflicts uh, with uh, George Washington and St. Clair, he said that the president could withhold information from Congress if there was a public need or a public interest, public, not private. And yet, it, as Mark uh, has explained, I think we're getting away from long-term institutional interests and public interests and into short-term uh, personal interests. And it comes out very well in the material on Clinton, where uh, if you're sitting at a meeting with him, and he says, if I don't release this information, and if I drag it out for two or three years, I can save my presidency. And you say, you'll hurt, <laughs> you'll hurt, the, you'll hurt the presidency. Uh, you, you're not going to, you and I won't come yeah. off very well at such a meeting. So it's a state, a state of affairs where individual presidents, I think, are showing that they have less regard for long-term institutional interests and much more interest in their own private short-term interest. Just the interesting development we're in. Yeah, thank you. Should I respond after each commentator, or should I allow the... Uh, you now, you yeah, know. okay. I, I thought I would wait for each of the... Each, no, each, no. Yeah, okay. My comments will be a little longer. <laughs> <coughs> I'm afraid between flying between 
Texas, Washington, and Chapel Hill, I've been exposed to every known allergen there is. <laughs> and so I'm simultaneously fighting off uh, closing up of my ears and uh, the effects of, of uh, decongestant. So if I um, sound incoherent as I'm uh, reading my presentation, that's probably c because I am. A and if I fall asleep in the middle of it, um, just feel free, Mark, to uh, give me a nudge. <laughs> Sharp shoulder. A and if I talk too quietly and you can't hear, please give me a sign because I can't hear at all, so I don't know whether I'm <laughs> being heard at all or not. <clears throat> I want to thank um, Editor Shannon Stevenson um, and Dean Bartlett for inviting me to uh, participate in this conference. Um, I know it's difficult to bring someone over from the other side of heaven. Um, and I won't say anything about uh, not being in the final four since we have little to say on that matter <laughs> these days. <clears throat> I, I do think um, one thing is important to note that Dean Smith no longer has to worry about simultaneously holding the best and the worst records at Chapel Hill. Um, our current coach has managed to snatch from him that, that the, at least the, um, the worst of those records. <clears throat> Mark Rozelle has prepared a re review of recent events involving executive privilege. It is certainly a timely subject. In a series of executive actions during the first, their first year in office and well before obtaining the home field advantage provided by 911, the Bush administration, the current Bush administration, demonstrated a determination to redefine executive privilege, expanding its application, extending its durability, widening the circle of those who can assert it, and inevitably reversing the basic presumptions about Republican accountability, and Republican with a small r. This determination derives from a broad theme they exploited in the campaign about restoring the presidency. It, is cl it clearly rankled those in the broad-based Bush entourage that the public's 1992 choice for president had so clearly undermined the public revenant, re reverence for the office they all um, am had ambitions for. This theme had an electoral resonance when pollsters asked them, the public responded that President Clinton's tenure in office had undermined public morality. This response had an important and positive contribution to the Bush vote calculus. From the beginning, however, what they articulated as a campaign theme meant more to the Bush team than merely expelling oral sex from the Oval Office. It meant restoring the president's policymaking advantages by emphasizing information control, and coalition building styles suited to the new president's personal strengths. Within that strategic context, their actions on executive privilege take on a more ominous light than merely business as usual between partisans. Which, by the way, I think is actually the proper characterization of the squabble between Clinton and the Congress over executive privilege. In responding to the Rozell paper, I I will underscore two themes. Behind these themes is a distinction that I want to make between the principle of executive privilege on the one hand and its practice by, three, by the three separated powers on the other. Both of these papers, Professor um, Rozelle's and Dr. Fisher's papers, uh, present today, presented today focus on the practice of executive privilege either as a series of decisions with consequences or as a compendium of congressional tools available in the struggle over information. Both of these authors clearly understand that practice reflects on principle. Um, Professor Rosell even makes claims about that relationship when he um, condemns or indicts the Clinton administration for undermining the confidence that we have in executive privilege. But neither, is, neither paper is self-conscious about specifying either what that principle is or how practice might affect it. With this distinction highlighted between practice and principle, let me preview two, my two themes. First, while he may have maintained a record-breaking pace on asserting executive privilege, President Clinton's assertions actually tell us little about the current state of the principle of executive privilege. They do demonstrate for us something about the balance of power between the parties involved in privilege. 
especially when considered in light of the scholarly contributions of two others in today's symposium, Drs. Munger and Fisher. Both, but on reflection, Clinton's assertions themselves, weak and self-serving as they were, probably did little damage to the principle itself. And that's something on which we, I guess we're going to disagree. Second, the Bush practices uh, to date on executive privilege underscore an ambitious assault designed, unlike Clinton's assertions, to establish a new balance in principle, not in practice. It is not so much his assertions on privilege, uh, his assertions on privilege over Cheney's Energy Task Force, for example, which are likely to end up, which are likely to end up like Clinton's for, for the very same reasons, but is the administration's organizational plans revealed in its latest executive order on the Presidential Records Act that is the real highlight of the Bush experience to date. Distinguishing between principle and practice, we can see that in the Bush executive order, we observe a true threat to common expectations and thus a real alteration in principle. Let's turn for, to the first point, that Clinton's assertions tell us little about the principle of executive privilege. <clears throat> Before the studios began trashing a beautiful mind in the run-up to the Oscars, it seemed a fitting thing to point out that John Nash is a better public guide to executive privilege than James Madison. While Madison's constitutional system set the broad parameters, it is Nash's world of strategy and counter-strategy that dictates the actual practice of executive privilege as a principle. We can understand the importance of strategic considerations in the interplay between Congress and President by referring to what Michael Munger has called the, quote, congressional dominance theorem. Now, this is something from political science. Um, and you just have to bear with me. <laughs> <clears throat> and in equilibrium, and given solid expectation of each other's intentions, whatever Congress wants, it gets. In what constitutes an empirical corollary to that theorem, Dr. Fisher's paper, presented later this day, details the wonderfully diverse and powerful fusillade of congressional weapons designed to enforce that theorem. It is worth noting how, given this fuselage of, fuselade of available weapons, the contemporary practice of asserting executive privilege has uniformly ended in presidential capitulation under congressional pressures. Except in those rare cases where disputes end up resolved by the courts, which I will talk about in the question and answering session, disputes with Congress get resolved to congressional satisfaction. In equilibrium, though, that is precisely what we, would, we should expect of practice on this principle. The more each of the constitutional actors understands their competitors' intentions, their internal deliberations, their patterns of consideration and decision-making, the more likely they are to mimic the strategic balance found in the congressional dominance theorem. Each institution would settle into the common ground. That is, a common appreciation for those topics on which limited circulation of information is actually in everyone's interest, and a common understanding of what information the Congress will then be able to secure through its considerable capacities. As a result, what few disputes over information we actually observe would uniformly be about information not in the common ground, i.e., not likely to pass the executive privilege muster and would result in stalling tactics by the executive and would eventually be resolved by executive capitulation to shows of congressional force. Hence, given these considerations from Nash, obvious uh, observed presidential assertions of executive privilege constitute the eccentricities in the system and not the exemplar. Studying the system's eccentricities, we are likely to conclude that the principle of privilege has become confrontational rather than cooperative, polarized rather than nonpartisan, campaigning rather than governing. But given the distinction between principle and observed practice, these would seem unfortunate conclusions. While it is clear that many, if not all, the Clinton assertions of privilege were defensive maneuvers designed to delay the release of embarrassing and politically partisan information, there is no reason to conclude necessarily that those revelations affected that commonality between institutions. The understanding that state secrets should not circulate widely, that ongoing investigations should not be compromised, and that the president's deliberations are improved if held behind a solid screen of confidentiality. After all, when did anyone in the Republican majority discover something from the disputed Clinton papers 
that they didn't expect to find. They may have made for discouraging news when the delayed information was finally assayed, but surely Republicans did not expect to find justifiable assertions of privilege behind the screen provided by the Clinton administration, especially when they, or the Republicans' investigations themselves, were so obviously partisan in nature to begin with. So the Clinton assertions, flawed as they were, could not have affected the real balance on executive privilege any more than hearing about a couple of mothers drowning their children undermines the common expectation of motherly love. Practice and principle on this point are not so directly connected. By contrast to the, the Clinton record on failed assertions, the Bush record is more troubling. For one thing, the Bush administration has a different objective in mind. It's quite clear. First of all, they are not simply trying to stall a partisan mob bent on political advantage, like the Clinton people were. Even before 9-1-1, they did not have a passionate majority pursuing them. And the second difference is that because of their recorded, because their record is focused on a different goal, because of this first difference, they are more likely to succeed in altering the principle rather than the practice of executive privilege. In the strategic struggle over intentions, highfalutin goals are much more dangerous than mere selfishness. <laughs> Clearly, two of the three instances of the Bush assertions described by Professor Rizal, the Justice Department closed cases, and the Cheney Energy Task Force are situations in which the Bush administration is seeking protection for a prop from a proper congressional investigation. As such, they are likely to fail once the congressional machinery gets moving. After all, in equilibrium, what Congress wants, it gets. Delay, of course, is always a viable presidential strategy when you have to, to weigh, when you have no way to rein in your own partisans or defeat your opponents. The administration's changes to the Presidential Records Act, on the other hand, are, are though far less entrancing, are nevertheless serious modifications of the process of circulating information if not a threat to the commonality of executive privilege itself. While I was uncomfortable with the hyperbolic phrases Dr. Rozelle used, like posing a juxtaposition between the president's penchant for secrecy and a dedication to openness in this section of his paper, I do think Professor Rozelle has correctly identified many of the most troubling aspects of the Bush agenda. The Bush people intend to expand those who can assert privilege, both in the administration and across time so much so that, that they propose an inherited right of privilege that would extend assertions into the foreseeable future. While that affects the work of historians, it also affects the more important relationship of accountability between governors and the sovereign people central to our republican democracy. Though advisors rarely practice circumspection in giving advice to the president, to the president the current statutory limit of 12 years on sequestering that advice provides plenty of confidentiality and plenty of an expectation of confidentiality. Trying to reverse the political compromise built into the statute itself by executive fiat clearly redefines the principle of common ground on confidentiality. It violates a true, tested, Republican principle. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Changing things in this way is bad for the principle itself. Expanding by fiat the types of information covered is, a, is again dangerous. What is most dangerous to the principle, though, is the assertion in the order that the sitting president yields up a central tenet of accountability, that barring extraordinary circumstances, the sitting elected government will, will yield its judgment to the retiring president on assertions of executive privilege regarding archived information. Such a modification of the principle of governance embedded in executive privilege can, cannot go unchallenged because it restructures our entire language of accountability and what elections mean. It is probably hyperbole on my part, and I will apologize here in advance for saying this, but in administrations whose status as the elected government is itself so tenuous should not be rearranging the responsibilities that election implies. But I think what we see in the current administration is not only a determination to change the principle and substance, but a strategic expectation that their determination will find a willing majority in the federal courts. To read Justice Rehnquist on executive privilege as a principle is indeed chilling 
And I think they count on that in the White House to secure their gold in redefining the principle. Maybe the fact that the courts have already handed Governor Bush one important prize might undermine the likelihood that it will do so again so quickly and on so brash an attempt to, op op uh, to upset the common balance. Maybe I should split the difference and do half of this standing up, half sitting down. But <laughs> I will try to split the time uh, length so that we can get to some questions and avoid having us being trampled. This speaks to get between the audience and the break. Uh, it's always a dangerous position to be in. Uh, let me give you um, a perspective that I'm just going to call uh, the view from the executive branch. It's just a view uh, from the executive branch. I was not intimately involved in uh, a number of the incidents that Dr. Fisher and Professor Rizal recount uh, occurring during the Clinton administration, but I am familiar with a number of them. Uh, I do want to generalize and not talk about uh, specifics, however. Uh, but I do think, uh, since Dr. Fisher is a, um, a creature of the Congress, and um, Mark Rosell, although he uh, supports the notion of executive privilege, I find uh, sidling more to the congressional side of the question than the presidential, that you have some <laughs> reflection of uh, this issue from that side. Because it is an issue, I think, that looks very much different to you depending on where you sit. And it's not so much a matter of being Democrat or Republican, but it's a matter of being uh, in the executive or in Congress. And I have something of a schizophrenia about this since I've worked, had the pleasure of working in both of these institutions. I can, so I can tell you personally, <laughs> I felt a lot differently about executive privilege when I was working for the Senate Judiciary Committee than I did when I was at the <laughs> Office of Legal Counsel in the Clinton administration. There are two discourses and logics with respect to executive privilege. There's the discourse and logic of governing. How does executive privilege fit into an overall constitutional structure designed for sound governance? And there's a logic and there's a discourse and logic of campaigning. I would call this politics, but I have a higher uh, regard for the word politics than this, uh, this logic and discourse reflects. It has to do with getting elected or being defeated, um, electoral considerations. How does executive privilege fit into the overall set of weapons and tools the opposing parties have in their struggle to capture control of one or more of the elected branches of the federal government? Now, when the branches of government are in the hands of opposing parties, both the logic of governing and the logic of campaigning are fully implicated in the struggle over documents, information, confidential uh, data, and the like. Putting the two branches in the same hands doesn't necessarily eliminate the applicability of the logic of governing, but it mutes it a great deal. Dan Burton going after records from the Janet Reno Justice Department uh, implicates the logic of campaigning in much different ways than Dan Burton going after the same documents from the Bush Department of Justice. Now, I'll come back to this, but just step back for a minute and let me uh, put on the table the kinds of interests that any president is going to have in asserting uh, executive privilege, some of them more laudatory than others. Um, information is power. You control information, you control the debate, you control the agenda. Um, we're seeing a lot of the effects of information being power in the post-9-11 um, discourse or lack of it over certain aspects of the uh, administration's implementation of uh, homeland security and, and foreign affairs um, um, undertakings. Uh, Professor Roselle doesn't mention, but Dr. Fisher does, uh, the, the refusal of the administration to send Tom Ridge up to testify um, before uh, requests, uh, in response to requests to the committees. Uh, obviously, there is a concern that any president has uh, which may not be the most laudatory, but that if I'm going to get into a dispute uh, with the Congress, uh, I've increased my chances of prevailing to the extent I control information and the debate. Confidentiality, of course, is also conducive to candid internal debate and advice, and that's the interest that uh, 
uh, court opinions going back to U.S. versus Nixon have placed at the center of the rationale for executive privilege. Uh, the loss of confidentiality can affect third-party rights and interests. That explains to some degree why the Department of Justice is reluctant to give out unexpurgated data uh, uh, from the um, uh, prosecutorial files, which often include uh, unsubstantiated allegations about the behavior of people who don't end up being indicted but who might be defamed by the disclosure of that kind of information, just as one small example of the impact on third parties. A more dramatic example is, is uh, revealing uh, confidential sources in uh, prosecutorial uh, files and uh, in some extreme cases putting the life of those individuals at jeopardy. Uh, so those kind of interests can lead you to want to keep things in confidence. Loss of confidence can limit the executive's ability to negotiate or deal with other countries or to investigate crime. And particularly with respect to Congress, information given to Congress cannot be given just to one side. So the consequence of acquiescing in even friendly requests from members of the president's own party results in disclosing the information to the other side and implicating the, the, the logic of campaigning. Um, and there's finally, and related to this, just the visceral principle that I think we all share to one degree or another, which is, which can be captured by thinking that you don't want a spy in your own team's locker room. Uh, you want to have the opportunity to deliberate uh, candidly among yourselves, plot a strategy. This is, after all, a, a, a conversation between two separated equal power branches of government. You want to plot strategy as often as you want to worry about how to reach the right public policy conclusion. So these are all considerations that are going to present themselves even when members of their own party are in control of Congress. And I have found in discussing these issues with other attorneys that, as I indicated at the beginning, it's much more likely that our views break down along lines of whether you've worked for the Congress versus whether you've worked for the executive than whether you're a Republican or whether you're a Democrat. Uh, I've participated in a number of conferences and um, panels uh, in the past uh, six, seven years on issues about executive privilege and, and uh, congressional oversight. Um, and I can tell you from being on panels with people who served in the Reagan and Bush administrations and are now, some of them, back in the administration, that they thought that us Clintonites were selling, giving away the store. Uh, they were very interested in and, and totally wedded to the interpretation, uh, not taken up by Professor Rizal, but adopted by a number of others, that in fact we weren't being vigorous enough in taking what Democratic congressional staffers in the 80s always thought were Republican positions. Well, what, what, what we were misunderstanding, and once we became the party of the presidency for a little while, having been so long the party of Congress, was that executive privilege works to the advantage of the president, <laughs> so that when your guy is the president, You've got different expectations and attitudes over the way that uh, debate and conflict should be um, resolved. Now, when you look at exe the executive privilege versus con Congress uh, requests for information disputes from the perspective of the logic of campaigning, so you're in the posture, let's say, of uh, the branch of government requesting the information being the opposite political party than your own, the following attributes of oversight requests for information stand out uh, fairly quickly once you would get involved in these, in these disputes. One, from, from the point of view of us down Pennsylvania Avenue, these oversight requests look to be awfully cheap and easy means of harassing the administration. It's the same principle that it's always easier as an attorney to propound discovery than it is to answer discovery seems to apply in spades to this kind of, kind of dynamic. Uh, oversight requests of the kind that were coming out of committees and subcommittees uh, chaired by um, representatives McIntosh, um, Burton, uh, Klinger, can be done unilaterally by committee chairs and committee majorities. There's no need at the committee level to have a floor debate over whether to issue that request. You, it becomes a problem in seeking a contempt citation later on for refusal. But these requests are generated by committees and sometimes by the chair acting unilaterally and sometimes by uh, non-chair members of the committee uh, who may have chairmanships of subcommittees or not. As a result, they can come out of committees without 
the kind of back and forth negotiated political compromises that would have to be undertaken if you needed to cobble together a majority on the floor in order to pass a, a resolution of inquiry, say, which is a useful tool and used much less frequently than, than committee requests. So that you take committees that tend to be populated by people who are on the ideological partisan end of their respective national parties, like the Judiciary Committee, like the Government Reform Committee, which is partisan on both sides. That's the most liberal Democrats and the most conservative Republicans. You're going to get, viewed from the executive branch perspective, the most politically driven, politically partisan investigatory requests coming out of those committees. Without, as you say, the need for the chairman even to bargain with moderate members of his or her own party. The upside of, in terms of partisan or political impact, of these scandal-related investigations looks enormous. <laughs> Maybe low probability, but possibility of bringing down the presidency if one of these, if one of these uh, mudslings hits the wall and really sticks. So the stakes appear to be very high. They're extremely disruptive to the administration. And the kicker, many of them don't appear from the vantage point of someone skeptical about them as going after issues or magnitudes of dollars or activities inside the executive branch that seem to be the kind of thing that would be on the top of your priority list if you were interested in the kind of classic public policy idealistic interpretation of oversight, which is regular review of agency programs with a view to making legislative changes <laughs> to the extent that uh, inefficiencies have been discovered and the like. So I've called this kind of oversight, and others have the same, gotcha oversight. It is oversight intended to serve a predominantly campaign-oriented purpose. At least that's the perception from the executive branch uh, point of view with respect to many of the uh, Clinton administration, certainly, uh, controversial oversight requests, many of them to an unprecedented degree of which were directed directly at the White House and personnel in the White House. Um, and I might mention the, the memorandum that was circulated by the Republican leadership in the 104th Congress, I think, urging chairman to go after the scandal kinds of oversight as opposed to the programmatic kinds of oversight. But I won't. <laughs> <laughs> now, what that produces, I think, is um, an almost inevitable uh, tendency, it certainly produces it as a matter of fact, to resist <laughs> the impact, the negative downside impact of this kind of oversight, which in, I think, a strictly constitutional legal sense is within the power of the Congress, since the Congress, to the extent the courts have opined on this, has very broad powers of investigation, and rightly so, but certainly seems in the league for being classified as an abuse of those powers. <laughs> or at least a, um, a set of priorities that are interestingly correlated to political impact and interestingly uncoordinated to uh, the interests of uh, programmatic or regularized kind of, kind of oversight. So that's only to explain what the elephant looks like from the vantage point of the executive branch. Um, I do think something different is going on in the Bush administration. Um, there is, however, I think, um, an element of the logic of campaigning that is present there. But I actually do think, based on conversations I've had with people when they were out of the administration that are now back in, that there is a sincere, uh, constitutionally driven perception that the Clinton administration gave away too much uh, to Congress, and it's time to have backbone and stand up and, uh, and resist. Um, I agree with Professor Rosell that it's a little mysterious to figure out the uh, reasons that they've selected these grounds to fight on, although uh, you can, you can uh, speculate as to some reasons. Um, the GAO fight, just to use one example, and I won't go through them all, one has to recall that the GAO investigation was prompted by the letter from two minority members of Congress, Dingell and Waxman. Um, and now, uh, by, the, by the 
received practice of the uh, office, of, uh, the Government Accounting Office, uh, that request has stimulated the search for the Cheney files, even though it would appear by statute that something more formal from a committee ought to be forthcoming. Uh, that isn't, in fact, the way the GAO has ever operated. They respond to individual members to the extent they, they can. Members of the Democratic Party. Uh, if I were in the executive branch, I might want to resist and, f and force the Congress to become more invested itself in this request before I capitulate it. Along the same principle that only the president can assert executive privilege, I might want to test the proposition that at least when you're going after things that are in the White House and in the office of the vice president and the president, I'm not going to respond until uh, I get a formal request from a, a more official subdivision of the Congress, the, ch uh, the uh, committee or perhaps even the whole, the whole uh, chamber, before I, before I simply roll over to what looks to me like a bureaucratic institution more or less formulaically carrying out a request generated by two minority members. So there may be some logic of, of campaigning involved in Cheney in, in that uh, it could be there's something damaging in these documents. Like the, 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 what's, what the uh, GAO request has been chiseled down to, I find it hard to believe that there is anything damaging there since I think we know every, uh, a lot about uh, who was at these various meetings. Uh, but there may also be this point that I think the Bush administration is quite sincere about pursuing of finding ways to uh, constrain what they view to be a quite out of control octopus of investigatory methods in which, as uh, Dr. Fisher will tell you after the break, and Professor Sullivan already has, Congress really has all the cards uh, if they want to uh, push the matter. So probe for ways in which you can disarm Congress a little bit on the margins uh, may be something that the Bush administration is trying to do in these, um, these uh, fights that it has chosen to pick early on in its administration. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, we have so little time for Q&A that maybe I should just thank the others for their good comments and we'll have plenty of chance to talk about it. Um, just, just one very quick point. I'm not really terribly concerned about presidential capitulation or whether Congress has most of the cards in this battle because this is supposed to be a system based on openness and access to information. The nature of a democratic republic is that uh, openness of information should prevail and secre secrecy should be the exception. Presidents have capitulated on a number of occasions. That is absolutely right. On a number of those occasions, presidents initially stated out the position that uh, this was vital to the national security or vital to the national interest, and then when they gave up the information, what did we find out? Not once has the national interest been unduly harmed by a president turning information over to Congress. I can't, in, my, in all my studies of executive privilege, I cannot come up with one case where an administration said, we just can't take it anymore. Congress is giving us too much. We've got to turn it all over, and in so doing, knowingly harm the public interest. Any of our panelists a question? Uh, there are small microphones on your table, and those should be on. Uh, uh, yes, the gentleman. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Steve Hansen. I'm in the Special Collections Library here at Duke, but more relevantly, perhaps, I'm also president of the Society of American Archivists, and have just you saw the op-ed piece in the post. Right? So, mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, I think what's you know, I want to go back to what uh, Professor Solomon said. I think that. You know, what we're looking at, particularly with the Executive Order 13233, is not so much a sort of campaign-based or prosecutorial sort of assault on executive privilege as we are seeing a kind of fundamental shift. And, you know, I, I guess I have a question, and I'm not a lawyer, but, uh, you know, the question to which executive order, you know, to what extent can executive order override, you know, solid stature? Uh, Presidential Records Act is, is, is in the U.S. Code. And typically, it seems to me, executive orders do not burrow so deeply into, into statute in, in sort of maintaining their thing. But the, the, point, the point I want to make, I guess, is that the, 
further erosion of executive privilege by essentially designating it as executive order uh, says they can to their heirs, assigns, representatives, etc. But more importantly, from the perspective of the archival community, is that it threatens the long-term accuracy and authenticity of the record by essentially moving this information out of the hands of professional custodians who are trained to sift through this stuff and, and manage it in a responsible way, and essentially puts it in the hands of the family and you know whatever partisan or personal interest they might have. Would anyone care to address that one? Um, I'm not a lawyer either. Have you played one on TV? No, I haven't. <laughs> I, we, we, uh, helping draft executive orders is one of the chores of the Office of Legal Counsel, so I'll, just, I'll give you the legal answer. An executive order can't override a statute, so the issue is going to be in the litigation that's been filed uh, by, I think, your organization. Okay, we're not a part of that. All right. Yeah, others. It's going to be whether the elements of the executive order that have been discussed are valid interpretations of language in the statute or inconsistent with them. To the extent the answer is number two, they're going to be declared invalid. Uh, and to the extent the answer is number one, President Bush is going to accomplish what he seeks to accomplish. Yeah. Well, Representative Warren is turning to move forth legislation that will essentially nullify the executive order. Right. There may be it, a legislative response. It, it's not likely that's going to get anywhere, though. No. Oh, I think so. <laughs> You're dreaming. I mean, unless you've got a lot of money that I don't know about in the Society of American Archivists, you're not going to be able to lobby the way the other guys are going to be able to lobby. And that's just going to be, turn out to, there's just not an, an issue large enough in governance here to overcome the sizable advantages in campaigning that um, have been secured by this executive order. I, uh, unfortunately, the only hope is is that it would actually win in the courts. I, I think that's a, a big element of the, the administration strategy. They're looking for a fight. They've counted heads on the court. They think they can win. And they're just picking fights now, looking. I think they're trying to upgrade. On the one hand, they're trying to upgrade the principle and its practice between the executive and the Congress. As long as they've got a majority, they might as well try to, to, to raise up the level, the tenor of uh, the practice, but ultimately, I think they're looking for a fight. They think they can win on this. They think the Clinton people gave away the farm um, in a lot of different ways, on defense, on morals, on governance, and they intend to take it back in every aspect. Now, I do want to comment on the threat of the record, because I have a great deal of interest in them, much of my research is about, uh, depends upon archival records. And this issue does come up about the confidentiality of uh, advisors and their worrying about their place in history and, and all of that sort of stuff. And, and the fact of the matter is the record has disappeared not because um, people are worried about protecting their place in history and the lack of confidentiality, this, this wall of confidentiality that ought to be there. They, the record is being lost because of the, because, to use Professor Schroeder's concept, the, the entire practice of government now is built on campaigning. And as a consequence, the criminal, the insertion, the criminality of politics and the insertion of the subpoena, the criminal subpoena into the deliberative process makes it so that nobody keeps records. My boss, James Baker, didn't, after his second year as chief of staff, never kept a record, never wrote down a thing in the White House. And, and Bill will tell you that it's a common practice in the White House to simply avoid. You may take notes during a meeting, but you drop them in the shredder on the way out the door um, just because there's, there's so much at stake at um, avoiding a, a criminal subpoena. And that's what's undermining the record more than anything. Further questions? All right. Um, at this point, I, I guess we'll take a brief break. And uh, you're welcome to join us for refreshments in the corridor. Uh, we'll reconvene at 3.30, or 3.15, excuse me, for the next panel. <laughs>
Uh, and I'd like, uh, if we could please honor and thank our panelists for giving great. such a great presentation today.